Welcome to Rotary and Serving Our Community. My name is Wade Nomura and today we're going to take a look at membership and how membership affects Rotary. And with us today we have uh, two special guests. I have Don Kramer and Steve Lingenbrink. Steve, by the way, thanks for coming back. I know you're coming in all the way from Seattle. That's quite the trip. That's right. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Don, we're going to start with you. Tell us a little bit about yourself, your personal life. Well, I live in Pacific Grove, California. I've been in Rotary um, last week, celebrated 25 years in my club. Um, I'm married. I have two grown children and five grandchildren and retired from IBM uh, after 25 years. And then I had my own consulting firm that specialized in accelerating change through using communication technologies. So uh, that's what brought me back to California after my IBM career and uh, discovered Rotary, and uh, I've been doing a lot with Rotary since then. <laughs> I know you have. That's my retirement job. <laughs> good, good. I'm glad you got to do it at retirement age instead of still working. That, that helps. <laughs> yeah. Steve, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I, I live in the Seattle area over in uh, Bellevue, Washington, and uh, I'm a trial attorney. I've been practicing law for 36 years, and I've got uh, uh, a wife of 26 years, uh, my wife Terry, and we have two daughters. One is 21 years old and one is 19 years old. The 21-year-old just recently started her own um, hairstyling business. And the 19-year-old is uh, at Seattle University and she's in the Seattle Rotaract Club. Great. All yeah. Right. Donna, tell us a little bit about your Rotary experience. What got you into Rotary and what have you enjoyed out of it? Well, you know, I always say, how do you get in Rotary? Somebody asks you. Uh, when I came back from the East Coast, uh, when we retired to live in Carmel, I used to walk my dog every morning, and there was a fellow down the street that walked his dog, and we got to talking one day. And uh, he said, you know how to come to this meeting I go to? It's a morning meeting. I said, sure. Because I was actually looking for friends, because I was brand new to the area. And so I went to the meeting, and uh, they had a speaker. This is kind of interesting for membership. They had a speaker that was talking uh, about a program. We have Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, and she was looking for people to kind of host foreign officers that were coming, which was kind of my alley. So I got up and sort of volunteered the club to take this thing on. Now, I was a visitor, remind you, the first day. <laughs> <laughs> so after the meeting, I went home. My wife said, how'd you like the meeting? I said, well, I, I enjoyed it very much, but I don't think they're going to invite me back. <laughs> but they did invite me back. Oh, that's good. <laughs> and so that started my Rotary career. From there, I, I was consulting at the time, and so I didn't make the, the weekly meetings always, but usually home on the weekend. So if they had a project, I would help with the project. And I'm glad to see that we're changing these meeting rules because had those rules that we have now in place I wouldn't have been a Rotarian mm. because of the meetings I was missing. But once I retired, then I became the president of the club. And uh, a few years later, I ran for district governor and was a governor. And then I was lucky enough, the first time they created what was called the Rotary Coordinator for zones, and I'm sure your listeners may know districts belong to zones, uh, I was a charter Rotary Coordinator. And that was quite an interesting job because at first we really didn't know what we were supposed to do. Uh, but it did evolve. And matter of fact, um, the, the subsequent Rotary Coordinator group has really refined that to make it a very powerful support organization. Right. So then, <clears throat> I mean, I won't, I won't go on too long, but as um, a district governor, I discovered that in my district, of the general population, 46% were Latino and 6% were Asian. And when I looked around the clubs, we didn't match any of that. So I decided we've got to start making some inroads there. So long story short, we created the Fresno Latino Club and a Monterey Korean Club to start to break those bonds and molds, to start to, to, to move other cultures into Rotary in our district. Great, right. thank you. Steve, how about you? Well, my path was a little different. It was in 1992, someone asked me to a uh, rotary meeting uh, at a chamber mixer. And um, I went the next morning with the intent to visit one time politely and just say, well, 
that was nice, thank you very much, but Rotary's not for me. And I got there and I got treated like an honored guest. Um, you know, they wouldn't let me pay anything for breakfast and they, they sat me at a table with a bunch of really high powered business people and leaders in the community. And I started looking around realizing these people had really deep friendships that uh, had developed and they were having fun and they were doing great things in their community and around the world. And I, I took one look at it and said, boy, I, I need to find out more about this. And, uh, and that started the path uh, that ultimately ended up with me being uh, district governor in 2012-13. And, and now, uh, as Don mentioned, at the zone level, I'm the, the membership chair. And so uh, it's uh, really been a, a, great, a great ride and I've really enjoyed it since uh, that first fateful visit in 1992. <laughs> Great. One of the things that I noticed too, and I bet Steve's got the same experience, I've developed lifelong friends through Rotary. Yeah. Not only the club, but also as you get into leadership levels, you connect with other people uh, in Rotary at that level, and you just become friends forever. And so that's, that's the neat, that's what I was looking for when I joined <laughs> Rotary, and I got it big time. Good, yeah. good. So um, doing a show on membership specific, tell us a little bit about why you think membership is important. We'll start with you, Steve. Well, Rotary is a mem <coughs> membership organization. Um, you know, we are, um, without our members, uh, we can't do any of the great things that we do locally, um, nationally, and around the world. And so uh, the members are the lifeblood of the organization. And when Paul Harris started this uh, whole thing back in 1905, he realized that. He realized that they needed to, to grow it internationally in order to do the things that, uh, that they wanted to be able to accomplish. And so without the members, uh, they are our number one priority. Rotary International has been, uh, we've been trying to, uh, and are very near successfully eradicating polio from the face of the earth. And that's our number one program. But our number one priority is membership. Good, thank you. Don? Well, um, I mean, member, new members bring ideas, they bring energy, they bring all kinds of things to Rotary. And so we need to keep evolving. And the only way you can do that is have new members come on board. And so I think membership is key. I mean, the, if we don't have members, we don't have Rotary. Yeah. And uh, we need to keep building uh, the demographics of our, of our membership uh, to keep up with times. And uh, so I, it's, uh, mem members make Rotary what it is. True. How about the, uh, I would say, recent membership trends? Do you want to touch on that one, Steve? What do you, well, you mean by uh, numbers? The trends meaning uh, we know that North America, for example, is now kind of on the uh, downsizing of uh, membership itself, whereas there have been trends worldwide where it's actually expanding or increasing. Yeah, Rotary stayed at a, a certain level, about 1.2 million members for quite some time, over a decade. Um, and that's not all just through attrition of uh, members passing. It's, uh, it's people coming and going through the door. We've brought in about 1.2 million, and we've lost about 1.2 million. So um, areas, um, certain areas in Asia and Indian stuff are growing dramatically. Um, North America's uh, been down a bit, recently become a little more flat. Uh, Europe's down. Um, I think Latin America is kind of, kind of flat. But, uh, but those are the trends, um, and, and Don can speak more to the, the demographics of that. Okay. Well, I think internationally, you're right, Steve, we've grown in the Asian countries. Um, in India, in particular, is a very big rotary country, and why? Because their economy is starting to develop middle class, and that's a very strong rotary country. Uh, Africa is the same way. I was in Nigeria not too long ago, and that, they've got a very powerful rotary group in, in Nigeria, and that's because the middle class is there. So, but in the United States, uh, we have leveled off for some time, matter of fact, lost members in the United States. And I think that a lot of that has to do with just not adapting to the times. Um, we, we'll probably get into this, but the demographics in the United States are changing like crazy. But if you look at Rotary and the demographics, in many cases it's not changing much. We find clubs in large cities that used to have 400 members and they now have 100 members. If you look at the demographics of the large city, 
It's changed. That club did not adapt to the demographics, and therefore they lost their members. So it's just, you know, it's a long-term kind of thing, but you can see it. So um, starting again with you, Steve, what um, initiatives or changes is the zone or the western, western states doing to try and increase membership? Well, that's a, that's a great question, Wade. And, you know, and specifically, um, a couple years ago, we started to address that issue and tried to find out um, some information about why this was happening. Why do people join Rotary and why do people stay in Rotary? And um, Rotary International hired a, a company called Siegel and Gale to, to study a, a lot of things, but as far as membership goes, those two important questions, why do people join and why do they stay? And it's funny because uh, it, it mm -hmm. sort of correlates with what both Don and I said. You know, we, we, we joined because we saw that there was a great opportunity um, for friendship, you know, in, in, in our clubs. And so we've designed programs that um, specifically uh, instruct Rotarians on how to invite other people to Rotary, but more particularly what to do once somebody comes to Rotary. How do we deal with the issue of engagement and retention? And uh, the program that uh, was recently rolled out is called Priority One here on the West Coast in Zones 25 and 26. And it's broken down into a series of uh, workshops that uh, districts and clubs can use to help educate their members on how best to invite and how to, more importantly, retain me <coughs> new members in their clubs. And we've seen some increase in numbers over the last couple right, years. Good, good. Yeah. Don, how about you? Well, I have to say the Priority One program is working. Um, in fact, uh, on a side note, in our club, we're doing some um, renovation, if you will, and some of the, the concepts that Prior to One has put out we're using straight up front, and I think it's going to be valuable. The thing that I'm involved in, as you might know, is the whole um, diversity issue. Uh, we have recently announced the West Coast Diversity Initiative, and why was that announced? Well, when you look at the demographics of the West Coast, about 32% of our general population on the entire West Coast is Latino. And about 11% is from Asian communities. When you look at the districts, they're not matching that at all. In other words, one of the, one of the things that Rotary tries to do is mirror the communities they serve. We're not doing a very good job of that. So because of those numbers and because of the huge opportunity, I don't like to say it's a problem. It's really a, an opportunity for membership. We've put an initiative of four teams together, or actually uh, four teams, yes. One, believe it or not, is for baby boomers. We have 10,000 baby boomers retiring every day in the United States. They're healthy, they're educated, they've got money, and before long they look for something to do and give back to the community. So we're making an effort there to recruit the baby boomers. Also, from a cultural standpoint, we're looking at two areas. One is creating ethnic-based clubs. In other words, a club that has affinity either language or culture or something that people pull them together. And we're doing that because we have some successful clubs already in our districts that are doing that. So we're trying to model that and move forward. The other one is how do we get our existing clubs or new clubs to be culturally diverse? We don't have too much problem with the new clubs because we start young professional clubs. They tend to be diverse because that's their friend base. It's the middle clubs, the ones that, that have been around for a while that have trouble figuring out how to attract and how to attract uh, other cultures. So there's a team that's doing that. So what we're doing actually, and the other one is for women. We'd like to increase our percentage of women from 30% to 45% on the, t on the West Coast. So those teams are looking and producing best practice models, which will be able to help the districts and then the clubs have asked to increase diversity and their membership uh, through these programs. And this is a fairly new program, correct? Just one year old. Yes. One year old? Yes. Okay. Um, does that fit in the uh, model that you're working with also, Steve, the diversity initiative? Oh, very much so. And in fact, one of the workshops that uh, is being put together in the priority one um, one-hour workshops uh, is a uh, product on diversity and so 
There's such topics as orientation, how to properly uh, create long-term members, how to successfully sponsor a new club, um, retention, how to keep members happy, and then um, implementing action plans on membership, uh, particularly as to what Don was talking about, a, a one-hour workshop um, specifically addressing the initiative here, the diversity initiative on, on the West Coast. Okay, um, so if we look specifically at membership, and we look at the focus being the benefit to the members, could you uh, talk a little bit about that? What is the, I would say, the target for bringing in and attracting new members and keeping them? Steve? What do you mean by the target? The what I would say is, uh, you know, one of the reasons why people come and go from any organization is a lack of interest or just something that didn't fit. Oh. So as, as a club and through your initiatives, are you addressing that also? Yeah, very much so because the, there has to be a value. Um, you know, the reason that I joined Rotary, I explained a moment ago, was I saw great value there. Right. And um, not to go too far into detail, but um, it, it made me a better leader, a, a better attorney, a better father, a, you know, certainly uh, more successful in business. Um, so it fulfilled a lot of needs that I had as a young attorney at the time. And it, not to mention the fact that I also I had 120 new friends, right? <laughs> but uh, so that value has to be there. There's got to be the what's in it f for me. Right. And so when a member comes, they have to feel uh, a potential new member comes to visit the club. The club culture needs to be such that it embraces them and brings them in and shows them how their needs will be met by becoming part of this organization. And that's one key part of the Priority One presentation is anal analyzing your <coughs> club culture and deciding how and what areas of your club culture might need some improvement. Very good. So you do that through uh, an analysis, actually, of the club specific mm -hmm. at their request. That's right. Good. And a part of that probably spins off into the diversity component Well, and, and it's this value issue. Also, I think Rotary does, I, I had a lot of leadership opportunities when was my career with IBM, but the leadership opportunities that you have in a volunteer organization are different. Yeah. And so people gain a lot of experience there. Um, I've seen people actually be committee chairs that have never managed anything in their life, and with a little help, they learn how to manage projects. Uh, that helps at home, even in manager projects. So the value uh, uh, equation is important. This is interesting in diversity. If I bring a Latino professional to a club and he or she sees a Latino in leadership position in that club, that goes a lot toward making them more comfortable in the club, or if they see several. It makes them more comfortable. That's one of the ways that it, that it works. So that's the same uh, if you're pro trying to uh, bring women into your club. You want to make sure that you have women in leadership positions so the new guest female sees that happening and sees an opportunity to be a leader. So leadership is uh, one of the major components, it sounds like, of, of Rotary membership itself. Of course. So when you look at developing leaders, is that part of the plan also? Steve, I'll go with you. Well, that, you just, you hit the nail on the head because a lot of people join Rotary and they don't think of themselves as leaders. And they've never had to lead at, in, a, in a profit or nonprofit situation. They've never had to lead a group of volunteers before. But it's amazing to watch as they join committees and they start to learn how to interact with others. And ultimately, they're put in charge of an auction or a golf tournament or maybe the membership committee, <laughs> which is always a good one to join. <laughs> the, um, how they develop these leadership skills. And we actually help in developing those leadership skills at the, road, um, at the membership level. And it's so important because a lot of corporations don't invest in that anymore. And so the leadership training that, that Rotary offers is very unique proposition. Uh, that you don't really find anywhere else. And it's included in the cost of being a Rotarian. And in many cases, on-the-job leadership training. I mean, yes, we do have training sessions for our club leaders, but I think often they learn the leadership skills just on the job. Oh, I agree, things, right? yeah. Mm -hmm. So how do you uh, adjust, a, say, a leadership, or I'm sorry, a membership campaign based on not pushing too hard, not being over the top like a used car salesman? 
Is there a method, a style that you use, or is there something in place? Well, the, the product, if the, if the product's good, <laughs> it sells itself. Like the, the first right. visit I went, I was a reluctant visitor. I had no intentions of joining Rotary. But the product that I came and witnessed was so good that I wanted part of it. I wanted in right then. And um, so that, that's a product of the club culture. The club culture of that club was very, very strong, very healthy. Um, and, it, and it really had the right mix so that visitors would want, to, would want a part of it. They saw the value proposition when they came in the door. Don, same thing with you? And well, I th yeah, I think, uh, you know, it's <laughs> one of the problems we have, as Steve alluded to, is we, we tend to be able to attract members, but we don't keep them very long. As an example, I've done some studies on Latino members that have joined. Number one, they'll visit the club many times before they might join, but usually they don't. But if they do, it's average of 18 months that they'll be gone. And that's because we're not adding value in their sense. And it's more difficult now because they're a little bit outside their culture and language uh, comfort zones. It's the same with anyone, though. If, if you don't see values, you go forward and start to interact. It's important to get the new members involved in club activities very quickly so that they don't seem like they're newbies. And, and often we assign mentors that maybe is a Rotarian that's, that's good at that to show them kind of the ropes of, of Rotary and get them involved in the club. Visit other clubs, it's always important to do that. So uh, I think the value proposition is what keeps, keeps members. Good. Now, wait, if I could just ahead, quickly please. too, because um, I completely agree with what Don's saying. And one of the things that our zone, zone 2526 on their website, on zone2526.org, um, has a whole list of different topics that we can come in and help them with at the club level and at the district level to help with some of these if they feel that their club culture needs some adjustment or if the value proposition isn't there or they're <coughs> having trouble keeping members, we can help them with that. Sounds good. How receptive are the clubs um, or are they able to make transitions to change culture to fit, say, a new group of people they're trying to address? Steve, uh, I'll talk to you about that because you probably have a lot of experience with this. Is it something that a club culture can actually do the change, or is it something that's more difficult that the member would have to blend into? Well, you know, it's an, it, it's an interesting question because um, it's a, sort of a chicken or an egg thing. The, there is a very um, strong desire of people to stay the same, and, and people are oftentimes, you know, members in Rotary Clubs are, are afraid of change. And so we have to demonstrate to the members why it's good for their club to analyze their culture and why it's good to adapt that culture to be able to bring in diversity, new members, younger members, all of the things that a club needs to be healthy. And once you expose them to that and they see it, then the light bulb goes on. It's like, oh, okay, now I understand what you're talking about. But if you just come in and say, oh, your culture's no good, you gotta change, you're gonna meet a, you know, you're gonna meet, meet a brick wall. So you have to take them through an exercise of analyzing where they're currently at and then let them see where the, where the issues are, where they can improve, and, and then it becomes self-evident. So that's a great question, and, and it, it, it has to be handled uh, tactfully, otherwise you can get you know, the wrong result. True. I, you know. I agree with Steve. The, the thing I've discovered, if clubs want to change their culture, or if they want to be accepting of other cultures now, ethnic cultures, the club has to have a plan. They can, it doesn't just happen because somebody says we're going to do it. Mm -hmm. the, the leadership of the club has to get together and say, here are the reasons we need to change. And this is what it's going to gain us if we do. This is the value it's going to bring to our members. This is the value it's going to bring to their families. But even more importantly, what value are we going to bring to our community that we're serving? True. If that plan's in place and you can get the club members to buy into it, then it's sort of much easier to change cultures or adapt to it to the demographics around you. If that doesn't happen, then we see a lot of wasted effort. Uh, sometimes it actually angers people because they've tried something that didn't work. That's because the plan wasn't really solid to begin with. Good. Uh, Steve, we'll start with you again. Do you have an example of a club that's been successful in maybe adopting to and creating an increase in membership through some of the objectives that the zone people have put forward? Yeah, and there's 
one specific club that comes to mind is the one in the Portland area called the, the New Generations Club that was started a couple years ago. And they um, saw a need for a, uh, a very affordable club where the entry point would be very, uh, very inexpensive and that there would be a variety of different types of meetings. They wouldn't just meet on a regular basis at Monday night at 5 o'clock every day of the week. Um, I mean every Monday of the, of the month, excuse me. And um, so they were flexible. They'd have a meeting where it'd be online one week, they'd do a project where they'd go serve food in a, uh, or collect food for a food bank or do some outreach program. Then they'd have an actual sit-down meeting one night, but usually it was over um, cocktails or something. So they were very, very flexible in the way that their meetings were, and they purposefully invited um, younger professionals and um, a great deal of diversity was very intentionally set at the beginning. And that club grew very quickly and is a very successful club in the Portland area. Great. We have uh, a few minutes. If you can give us a reflection of may maybe one of your examples of a <coughs> successful club that based on diversity. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of them. Interesting enough, as I got into this initiative, I discovered there there. Uh, quite a few clubs that are very diverse. Steve's got a good example. When we form a new club, even two years ago, with young professionals, and I, I mentioned before, they tends to be diverse just because that's the demographics they're dealing with. But we have a club in uh, District 5170, I'll use an example, a Cupertino club, that years ago, they made a plan because their community, that's sort of Silicon Valley, and so there's a lot of Asian and Indian uh, professionals in that area because of Silicon Valley. And they, they made a plan and, and a, on specifically to start to increase the diversity of their club. And they did that by going to, number one, the Vietnamese community, the Chinese community, and started doing, uh, participating in their, their uh, events and then getting joint projects. And if you look at that club now, it's about one-third Chinese, one-third Indian, and one-third Caucasian. Great. And they, they have a wonderful club. It's a great club. Well, both of you, thank you very much for your time. I know uh, you drove quite a ways, about four hours to get here. And Steve, uh, again, flying down from Seattle, we sure appreciate that. Taking a look at membership uh, in the future, it's going to be interesting to see which direction Rody ends up going. And I know there's uh, great things out in the horizon for us. With that, everybody, thank you very much for joining us and attending uh, this session. Membership is key to all of us and what we do in Rotary. If you're interested and not a Rotarian, please stop by and take a look at some of the clubs, see what they're doing because there's some outstanding things happening in this world because of Rotary. With that, thank you. We will see you next time.